Introduction of the Parables. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Parables by Lyman Abbott. Introduction Jesus, at the preaching of his first sermon at Nazareth, was assailed by a mob from which he escaped with his life only by that supreme dignity before which the passions of men were calmed and the curiosity of men was awed. It was the only time he was threatened with mob violence in Galilee, where, in his subsequent ministry, he appears to have been very popular. Great crowds, we are told, followed him wherever he went. To understand this mob is to get the key to his use of parables. For this purpose, it is necessary to know something of the Jewish history and the Jewish expectation. The Jews called themselves a peculiar people. One of their peculiarities was that they looked forward, not backward, for their golden age. Their prophets told them that the time was coming when they would be secured from their humiliation and come into a period of great wealth and dignity. Gentiles should come to their light and kings to the brightness of their rising wealth should no longer be accumulated in the hands of a few every man should sit under his own vine and fig tree violence and wasting should be no more known no one should molest or make afraid war should cease the implements of war should be turned into implements of agriculture and the garments rolled in the blood of the warrior should be but fuel for the fire. Education and religion should be universal. All men should know Jehovah to be God, and law should be based upon the principles of the Hebraic moral code. Out of these prophecies popular prejudice had evolved an expectation which, however incredible it may seem to us now was universally entertained by the jews in the first century of the christian era they believed that the succession of world empires babylonian persian macedonian roman would be succeeded by a hebrew world empire that jerusalem would become the world's capital and the Jewish nation the dominant world power. This revolution, they believe, would be accomplished by a king divinely appointed and divinely sustained and reinforced, and anointed of Jehovah. Jesus had cast the corrupt traitors out of the temple. The fame of his exploit had preceded him to his country home. The simple-hearted peasantry were proud of their rural rabbi, and his courage in defying the ecclesiastical ring at the metropolis. The leaders of the synagogue invited him to speak. The people were all eager to listen. The eyes of all that were in the synagogue were fastened on him, and they all wondered at the ease and grace of this untutored son of the carpenter whom they had known so long and yet comprehended so little but when he attacked through with great skill their orthodox doctrine of the kingdom of god all their jewish prejudices were aroused against him he recalled their own history to them he reminded them that jehovah had selected a syrian leper to be healed and that to a sidonian woman had given back her son their own history showed that he was not the god of the hebrews only but the god of the gentiles also and the kingdom which their prophets foretold was not a hebrew kingdom only but a world kingdom 
and all they in the synagogue says the sacred historian when they heard these things were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him unto the brow of the hill whereon their city was built that they might cast him down headlong but he passing through the midst of them went his way even after jesus spoke of the kingdom of god in parables that seeing they might see and not perceive he veiled the truth which unveiled had been rejected with such wrath and he did so that they might listen to him without perceiving the truth to which they would refuse to listen if they did perceive it and that so he might conduct them to his predetermined destination while they did not even know that they were on the journey more than one striking illustration of this use of the parables is afforded by incidents in his ministry thus when a theologian wishing to justify himself asked who is my neighbor jesus did not directly reply if he had said the samaritan who lives just across the border this catholic doctrine would have been contemptuously rejected instead he told the story of a man who fell among thieves and was wounded and left half dead by the roadside and a priest and a levite came by and left him uncared for but a samaritan coming by went to the wounded traveller's succour and bound up his wounds and set him on his own beast and took him to an inn and took care of him then he asked the theologian which was neighbour to the robbed traveller the priest the levite or the samaritan there was but one answer possible and it was given and ever since wherever the story of the gospel has been told the samaritan has been known in literature as the good samaritan there is nothing more difficult in teaching than to change the point of view of a people argument may sometimes convince of a special error or carry conviction of a special truth but to induce one who all his life has been accustomed to one aspect of a custom or an institution to look at another aspect is always extremely difficult for this purpose fiction is admirably adapted for by fiction the reader or hearer is insensibly put in possession of the new point of view he sees it so to speak without looking at it and without at all looking for it thousands of readers who would never have read a serious argument against war or have gone to a peace meeting to listen to one have read zola's le debacle or tolstoy's peace and war and have seen shame and cruelty where before they only saw glory and heroism the object of the parables then was to change the jewish point of view concerning the kingdom of god and yet through the disciples of jesus have been reading the parables for over eighteen centuries it is extraordinary how slow even his own followers have been to get the point of view which he sought to give them in spite of all that he could say we are told that his disciples believed that the kingdom of god would immediately appear when he went up to jerusalem for the last time they anticipated his coronation as king of the new kingdom hailed him with hosannas as the coming one quarrelled among themselves as to who should have the higher offices and two of them stealing a march upon the rest came with their mother to ask for a seat one on his right hand and the other on his left when he died they gave up their hope that he was the messiah 
when he rose from the dead their hopes rose too but their hope was that he would come presently in clouds and power and great glory with his holy angels to establish a world kingdom and place his disciples at its head when this coming was delayed some gave up their faith where they said is the promise of his coming all things continue as they were others retained their expectation but changed their conception of the new kingdom hoping for its realization in the conversion of rome from a pagan to a christian power others believed that the church was the kingdom and the domination of the world by the church would bring in the anticipated millennium others abandoned all hope of a kingdom of god on the earth substituted for it a celestial kingdom beyond the skies and regarded this life as only a school to prepare for the life to come or a probation to determine who were fitted for that life yet all the time the kingdom of god was growing up in the world gradually secretly intermixed with other and evil growths as the master had prophesied it would slavery was abolished autocracy was first mitigated then overthrown sensuality and self-indulgence were brought under control the horrors of war were alleviated private war abolished and gradual preparations made for peaceful arbitrament schools were multiplied and education made general if not universal the pagan conception of marriage as a purely commercial contract gave place to a conception of it as a divinely appointed order the burdens of poverty were lightened by charity and the problem how to abolish it altogether was seriously taken up the sick the lame the halt the blind the insane were taken care of the church became not merely an instrument to prepare men for heaven but also a school to teach men how to live upon the earth at length we are coming gradually to believe as we pray that the kingdom of god is to come and the will of god is to be done on the earth as in heaven our religion is becoming more sociological and less theological more a rational preparation to live nobly here less a magical preparation for an unknown life hereafter more practical less mystical more a realization of brotherhood less an anticipation of sainthood the parables are largely a prophetic forecast of this growth of nineteen centuries this moral and spiritual development under the teachings and influence of jesus christ for the kingdom of god of the parables is nothing other than christdom and the history of christdom affords the true interpretation of the parables the kingdom of god is at hand it is here it is a realized fact it is says paul righteousness and peace and joy in a holy spirit that is in a spirit consecrated to and in companionship with god wherever any one is conforming or endeavoring to conform life to a divine standard is living or is endeavoring to live in peace and goodwill with his neighbor and has in himself and in his fellowship with the father the fountain of gladness there is the kingdom of god it is in the spirit of righteousness which abolished slavery of peace which established the hague tribunal of joy which makes christmas a gladsome festival it is the square deal in politics and business goodwill in hospital and asylum joy in home and church it is doing justly loving mercy and walking humbly with god 
it is seen wherever service and piety are seen walking and working together the children of this kingdom are seeds they propagate the kingdom by spirituality reproducing themselves in the lives of others some seeds are planted by hand in prepared beds but more by the winds in unexpected places some minister to life by deliberate labors in church and sunday school others not less effectually by simply living righteously peacefully joyfully the child of the kingdom is a lamp he need not flash he need only let his light shine the children of the kingdom of evil are also seeds and they also propagate for every one is by his unconscious influence reproducing in the lives of others courage or cowardice candor or deceit justice or oppression service or self-seeking piety or irreverence we cannot separate ourselves from evil influences we cannot keep our children from evil influences the tares must grow with the wheat the evil with the good the children of light with the children of darkness it always has been so and it always will be so is the world growing better or worse both better and worse delirium tremens comes in with the invention of distilled liquors forgery with penmanship defalcation with a credit system the de amogue with democracy the corrupt ecclesiastic with the growth in power of the church the kingdom does not grow up spontaneously neither is it brought to earth by the king coming in clouds and power and great glory to establish it it is like a vineyard the fruitfulness of which depends on those who cultivate it like an estate who whose well-being depends on those who administer it the call to follow christ is a call to go to work in his vineyard to administer faithfully his affairs to do this requires labor often self-sacrificing labor many a hearer looking forward in anticipation to a kingdom of heaven beyond the cloud says blessed are they that shall eat bread in the kingdom of god but when they learn that the kingdom of god means meekness and courage and peaceableness and pureness of heart here on the earth they excuse themselves the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hid in a field or a pearl of great price yes we would like it very much but not if we must sell all that we have to possess it the price that john howard paid immuring himself in the presence of europe that david livingston paid exiling itself in the wilds of africa that dr grenfell pays practicing among the ice fields of labrador seems too great a price to many not all men are called on to pay this price for not all men are called to this service but all men are called to some service and none can do the service well and joyously who are not willing to pay whatever price the appointed service requires there is not in the service any question of wages it is not and cannot be rendered for wages the only possible service in the kingdom of god is service for love and he who enters late and serves but the last hour or two may get the same seeming wage as he who has borne the heat and burden of the day wages in the kingdom of god the wages may be poverty not wealth disgrace not glory wages tennyson has described the wages paid in the kingdom of god in contrast with those paid in the kingdom of the earth glory of warrior glory of orator 
glory of song paid with a voice flying by to be lost on an endless sea glory of virtue to fight to struggle to right the wrong nay but she aim not at glory nor lover of glory she give her the glory of going on and still to be what is the nature of the service to be rendered what great achievement summons the child of the kingdom what mystic experience is demanded of him no great achievement no mystic experience to be a child of the kingdom is to do with our life what the master did with his it is to feed the hungry clothe the naked visit the sick and the imprisoned comfort the sorrowing teach the ignorant do battle to the oppressor and corrupter of men and to lift up those that have fallen into temptation inspire them with hope and set them on their way again it is to be a good samaritan to be a faithful steward no greatness of wealth or position exempts no scantiness of wealth or capacity excuses if one has ten talents they are all to be used in service if one has but a single talent it is not to be wrapped in a napkin pure religion and undefiled is not merely to keep oneself unspotted from the world it is to visit the window and the fatherless in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world it is to use wealth in service things for men the shrewd but unscrupulous servant uses his lord's money to make friends of the lord's tenants it is shrewd for the scrupulous servant to use it since that money has been entrusted to him by his lord for that very purpose one cannot serve god and mammon but as has been well said he can serve god with mammon he who having more than he knows what to do with simply lays it up as in a granary may be rich but he is a rich fool but men's material needs are not his only needs they are not his chief needs his chief need is god to go seeking to save that which is lost to bring the mislaid soul back to its true place to bring the wanderer back to his true fellowship in the fold of god to welcome the son returning at the same time to himself and to his father this is to serve god this is to build up the kingdom of god on the earth whoever has come into the kingdom which is righteousness and peace and joy is by that very fact appointed to go out and bring others in whoever entereth in by the door is a shepherd of the sheep to every such an one some heart and life are open and he can influence some whom no other person can influence so well to this every follower of christ is commanded by the master and as the father has sent me even so send i you for this he is equipped not once for all in one life endowment but by daily life with and in the father he must have daily grace for daily needs eat day by day the bread that cometh down from heaven have not merely oil in his lamp when he sets out to meet the bridegroom but continual supply for a light which is continually calling for supply who is in this kingdom the little children for of such is the kingdom of heaven the son who goes when summoned to his father's work the publican who looking on a wicked life cries god be merciful to me a sinner the harlot who 
scorned of men but pitied by god finds in christ's words a new hope born within her and goes out to sin no more but not the proud professor of religion who thanks god that he is not as other men are and thinks he needs neither mercy for the past nor newness of life for the future because he is not an extortioner nor unjust nor an adulterer and fulfills all his church obligations for men are measured not by what they have not done but what they have done and the useless men like the fruitless tree is fit only to be cast away but men are also measured by their aspiration not by their achievement and he who desires righteousness and peace and joy in god and is willing to give all he possesses to secure for himself and to give to others this bestowment is in the kingdom of god however little he may have to give i have no wish to substitute my words for the words of the master my object in this introduction is to give the thoughtful reader a clue which he may use in interpreting for himself the parables which are in this volume reproduced the history of christendom is their best interpreter in the light of that interpretation each of them takes on a large significance the sour is no longer a single apostle to the genteels going forth into the pagan world with but a single companion despised by the jews and distrusted by the christian church at home the sower to-day is a great army of apostles teaching in every land and sowing everywhere the seeds of a christian civilization just laws emancipated labor organized charity popular education an ethical religion faith in a god of infinite compassion love which counts all men brethren and hope expecting in every day a better tomorrow and the best of all in the golden days beyond the grave the leaven hidden in three measures of meal is no longer represented by a single agitator hailed before the courts because his preaching has interfered with the sale of silver shrines for a heathen god it is represented by the long process of agitation which has destroyed slavery and set labor free has overthrown the autocracies inherited by western europe from pagan rome and is substituting therefore government of the people by the people and for the people the good samaritan is no longer a single lover of his kind stopping to render a brief service to his unfortunate fellow man he is represented in innumerable asylums hospitals and dispensaries in unpaid medical service rendered without stint in organized charity for the lame the halt the blind of body the mind and of moral nature i hear the clang of the ambulance bell in the street it is the good samaritan summoned by telephone and hurrying to succor some wounded one and every carriage motor or electric car stops or turns aside to let him pass there are still a great many rich fools in america who lose their poor lives in an endeavor to gain the whole world but never before were there so many faithful stewards who are exercising the same thought power on the problem how to distribute their wealth which they exercised upon the problem how to accumulate it nor do we need to wait for a future judgment day to see all nations gathered before the great throne and separated one from another as the shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats the separation is taking place before our eyes we can see it if we will 
and this separation is not made by acceptance or rejection of creeds not by use or disuse of liturgies not by regard or disregard for ecclesiastical orders and organizations but by the question who of us is following him who said of himself that he had come to preach glad tidings to the poor to heal the broken-hearted to proclaim deliverance to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised to preach the acceptable year of the lord those and only those who feed the hungry give drink to the thirsty clothe the naked are hospitable to the stranger or visit the sick and the imprisoned are in the kingdom of god and are doing the work of the king End of introduction recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter one of the parables by lyman abbott this librivox recording is in the public domain the sour matthew thirteen verse three to nine behold a sour went forth to sow and when he sowed some seeds fell by the wayside and the fowls came and devoured them up some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth and when the sun was up they were scorched and because they had no root they withered away and some fell among thorns and the thorns sprung up and choked them but others fell into good ground and brought forth fruit some a hundredfold some sixtyfold some thirtyfold who hath ears to hear let him hear end of chapter one recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter number two of the parables by lyman abbott this librivox recording is in the public domain the kingdom of heaven matthew thirteen verse twenty four to thirty the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field but while men slept his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way but when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit then appeared the tares also so the servants of the household came and said unto him sir didst not thou sow good seed in thy field from whence then hath it tares he said unto them an enemy hath done this the servants said unto him wilt thou then that we go and gather them up but he said nay lest while ye gather up the tares ye root up also the wheat with them let both grow together until the harvest and in the time of harvest i will say to the reapers gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them but gather the wheat into my barn end of chapter two recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter three of the parables by lyman abbott this librivox recording is in the public domain the lord and the servants matthew eighteen verses twenty three to thirty five therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants 
and when he had begun to reckon one was brought unto him which owed him ten thousand talents but for as much as he had not to pay his lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made the servant therefore fell down and worshipped him saying lord have patience with me and i will pay thee all then the lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt but the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants which owed him an hundred pence and he laid his hands on him and took him by the throat saying pay me that thou owest and his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him saying have patience with me and i will pay thee all and he would not but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt so when his fellow servants saw what was done they were very sorry and came and told unto their lord all that was done then this lord after that he had called him and said unto him o thou wicked servant i forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me shouldn't not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant even as i had pity on thee and his lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him so likewise shall my heavenly father do also unto you if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses end of chapter three recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter number four of the parables by lyman abbott this librivox recording is in the public domain the laborers in the vineyard matthews twenty verses one to sixteen for the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard and when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day he sent them into his vineyard and he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the market-place and said unto them go ye also into the vineyard and whatsoever is right i will give you and they went their way again he went out about the sixth and ninth hour and did likewise and about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle and saith unto them why stand ye here all day idle they say unto him because no man hath hired us he saith unto them go ye also into the vineyard and whatsoever is right that shall ye receive so when even was come the lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward call the laborers and give them their hire beginning from the last unto the first and when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour they received every man a penny but when the first came they supposed that they should have received more and they likewise received every man a penny and when they had received it they murmured against the good man of the house saying these last have wrought but one hour and thou hast made them equal unto us which have borne the burden and heat of the day but he answered one of them and said friend i do thee no wrong 
didst not thou agree with me for a penny take that thine is and go thy way i will give unto this last even as unto thee it is not lawful for me to do what i will with mine own is thine eye evil because i am good so the last shall be first and the first last for many be called but few chosen end of chapter four recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter five of the parables by lyman abbott this librivox recording is in the public domain the wedding guests matthew twenty two verses two to four the kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding and they would not come again he set forth other servants saying tell them which are bidden behold i have prepared my dinner my oxen and my fatlings are killed and all things are ready come unto the marriage but they made light of it and went their ways one to his farm another to his merchandise and the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them but when the king heard thereof he was wroth and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city then saith he to his servants the wedding is ready but they which were bidden were not worthy go ye therefore into the highways and as many as ye shall find bid to the marriage so those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found both bad and good and the wedding was furnished with guests and when the king came in to see the guests he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment and he saith unto him friend how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment and he was speechless then said the king to the servants bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many are called but few are chosen end of chapter five recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter six of the parables by lyman abbott this librivox recording is in the public domain the wise and the foolish virgins matthew twenty five verses one to twelve then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom and five of them were wise and five were foolish they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps while the bridegroom tarried they all slumbered and slept and at midnight there was a cry made behold the bridegroom cometh go ye out to meet him then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps and the foolish said unto the wise give us your oil for our lamps are gone out but the wise answered saying not so lest there be not enough for us and you but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves and while they went to buy the bridegroom came 
and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage and the door was shut afterward came also the other virgins saying lord lord open to us but he answered and said verily i say unto you i know you not end of chapter six recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter number seven of the parables by lyman abbott this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the talents matthew twenty five verses fourteen to thirty for the kingdom of heaven is as a man travelling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods and unto one he gave five talents to another two and to another one to every man according to his several ability and straightway took his journey then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents and likewise he that had received two he also gained other two but he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his lord's money after a long time the lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them and so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents saying lord thou deliveredest unto me five talents behold i have gained besides them five talents more his lord said unto him well done thou good and faithful servant thou hast been faithful over a few things i will make thee ruler over many things enter thou into the joy of thy lord he also that had received two talents came and said lord thou deliveredest unto me two talents behold i have gained two other talents besides them his lord said unto him well done good and faithful servant thou hast been faithful over a few things i will make thee ruler over many things enter thou into the joy of thy lord then he which had received the one talent came and said lord i knew thee that thou art an hard man reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strawed and i was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth lo there thou hast that is thine his lord answered and said unto him thou wicked and slothful servant thou knewest that i reap where i sow not and gather where i have not strawed thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers and then at my coming i should have received mine own with usury take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him which hath ten talents for unto every one that hath shall be given and he shall have abundance but from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath and cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth end of chapter seven recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter eight of the parables by lyman abbott this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the good samaritan luke ten verses thirty to thirty five a certain man went down from jerusalem to jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his raiment 
and wounded him and departed leaving him half dead and by chance there came down a certain priest that way and when he saw him he passed by on the other side and likewise a levite when he was at the place came and looked on him and passed by on the other side but a certain samaritan as he journeyed came where he was and when he saw him he had compassion on him and went to him and bound up his wounds pouring in oil and wine and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him and on the morrow when he departed he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him take care of him and whatsoever thou spendest more when i come again i will repay thee end of chapter eight recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter nine of the parables by lyman abbott this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the prodigal son luke fifteen verses eleven to thirty two a certain man had two sons and the younger of them said to his father father give me the portion of goods that falleth to me and he divided unto them his living and not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living and when he had spent all there rose a mighty famine in that land and he began to be in want and he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and he sent him into his fields to feed swine and he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat and no man gave unto him and when he came to himself he said how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare and i perish with hunger i will arise and go to my father and will say unto him father i have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son make me as one of thy hired servants and he arose and came to his father but when he was yet a great way off his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him and the son said unto him father i have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son but the father said to his servants bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry for this my son was dead and is alive again he was lost and is found and they began to be merry now his elder son was in the field and as he came and drew nigh to the house he heard music and dancing and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant and he said unto him thy brother is come and thy father hath killed the fatted calf because he hath received him safe and sound and he was angry and would not go in therefore came his father out and entreated him and he answering said to his father lo these many years do i serve thee neither transgressed i at any time thy commandment and yet thou never gravest me a kid that i might make merry with my friends but as soon as this thy son was come 
which hath devoured thy living with harlots thou hast killed for him the fatted calf and he said unto him son thou art ever with me and all that i have is thine it was meet that we should make merry and be glad for this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found end of chapter nine recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter ten of the parables by lyman abbott this librivox recording is in the public domain dives and lazarus luke twenty six nineteen to thirty one there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared scumptuously each day and there was a certain beggar named lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table moreover the dogs came and licked his sores and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into abraham's bosom the rich man also died and was buried and in hell he lifted up his eyes being in torments and seeth abraham afar off and lazarus in his bosom and he cried and said father abraham have mercy on me and send lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for i am tormented in this flame but abraham said son remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things and likewise lazarus evil things but now he is comforted and thou art tormented and besides all this between us and you there is a great gulf fixed so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot neither can they pass to us that would come from thence then he said i pray thee therefore father that thou wouldest send him to my father's house for i have five brethren that he may testify unto them lest they also come into this place of torment abraham said unto him they have moses and the prophets let them hear them and he said nay father abraham but if one went unto them from the dead they will repent and he said unto him if they hear not moses and the prophets neither will they be persuaded though one rose from the dead end of chapter ten recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter eleven of the parables by lyman abbott this librivox recording is in the public domain the pharisee and the publican luke twenty eight verses ten to fourteen two men went up into the temple to pray the one a pharisee and the other a publican the pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself god i thank thee that i am not as other men are extortioners unjust adulterers or even as this publican i fast twice in the week i give tithes of all that i possess and the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven but smote upon his breast saying god be merciful to me a sinner i tell you this man went down to his house justified rather than the other for every one that exalteth himself shall be abased 
and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. End of chapter 11 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 12 of the Parables by Lyman Abbott This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 12 The House Upon the Sands Matthews 7 verses 24 to 27 Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. End of chapter 12 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 13 of the Parables by Lyman Abbott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Husbandman and the Vineyard. Mark 12, verses 1 to 8. A certain man planted a vineyard, and set a hedge about it, and digged a place for the wine vat, and built a tower, and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. And at the season he sent to the husbandman a servant, that he might receive from the husbandman of the fruit of the vineyard. And they caught him, and beat him, and sent him away empty. And again he sent unto them another servant. And at him they cast stones, and wounded him in the head and sent him away shamefully handled. And again he sent another, and him they killed, and many others, beating some and killing some. Having yet therefore one son, his well-beloved, he sent him also last unto them, saying, They will reverence my son. But those husbandmen said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance shall be ours. And they took him, and killed him, and cast him out of the vineyard. End of chapter 13 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 14 of the Parables by Lyman Abbott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Sheep and the Goats. Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats, and he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was an hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. 
then shall the righteous answer him saying lord when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee or thirsty and gave thee drink when saw we thee a stranger and took thee in or naked and clothed thee or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee and the king shall answer and say unto them verily i say unto you inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren ye have done it unto me then shall he say also unto them on the left hand depart from me ye cursed into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels for i was and hungered and ye gave me no meat i was thirsty and ye gave me no drink i was a stranger and ye took me not in naked and ye clothed me not sick and in prison and ye visited me not then shall they also answer him saying lord when we saw we thee and hungered or a thirst or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister unto thee then shall he answer them saying verily i say unto you inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these ye did it not to me and these shall go away into everlasting punishment but the righteous into life eternal end of chapter 14 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc chapter 15 of the parables by lyman abbott this librivox recording is in the public domain the seed and the harvest mark 4 verses 26 to 29 so is the kingdom of god as if a man should cast seed into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day and the seed should spring and grow up he knoweth not how for the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself first the blade then the ear after that the full corn in the ear but when the fruit is brought forth immediately he pulleth in the sickle because the harvest is come End of chapter 15. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 16 of the Parables by Lyman Abbott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Fool and His Gods. Luke 7, verses 16 to 21 the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully and he thought within himself saying what shall i do because i have no room where to bestow my fruits and he said this will do i will pull down my barns and build greater and there will i bestow all my fruits and my goods and i will say to my soul soul thou hast much goods laid up for many years take thine ease eat drink and be merry but god said unto him thou fool this night thy soul shall be required of thee then whose shall these things be which thou hast provided so is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward god end of chapter 16 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c
Chapter Number Seventeen of the Parables by Lyman Abbott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. When the Lord cometh. Luke twelve verses thirty five to forty two. Let your loins be girded about, and your lights burning and ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their lord when he will return from the wedding that when he cometh and knocketh they may open unto him immediately blessed are those servants whom the lord when he cometh shall find watching verily i say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet, and will come forth and serve him. And if he shall come in the second watch, or come in the third watch, and find them so, blessed are those servants. And this know, that if the goodman of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched, and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. End of chapter 17 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter number 18 of the Parables by Lyman Abbott this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Faithful Steward Luke 12, verses 42 to 48 Who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household, to give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord when he cometh shall find so doing of a truth i say unto you that he will make him ruler over all that he hath but and if that servant say in his heart my lord delayeth his coming and shall begin to beat the men servants and maidens and to eat and drink and to be drunken the lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him and at an hour when he is not aware and will cut him in surrender and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers and that servant which knew his lord's will and prepared not himself neither did according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes but he that knew not and did not commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes for unto whomsoever much is given of him shall be much required and to whom men have committed much of him they will ask the more end of chapter 18 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc chapter 19 of the parables by lyman abbott this librivox recording is in the public domain the unwilling guests luke 14 verses 16 to 24 a certain man made a great supper and bade many and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden come for all things are now ready and they all with one consent began to make excuse the first said unto him i have bought a piece of ground and i must needs go and see it i pray thee have me excused and another said i have bought five yoke of oxen and i go to prove them i pray thee have me excused and another said i have married a wife 
and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came, and showed his lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor, and the maimed, and the halt, and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto thee, that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. End of chapter 19 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 20 of the Parables by Lyman Abbott This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Unjust Steward Luke 16 verses 1 to 8 there was a certain rich man which had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. And he called him, and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest be no longer steward. Then the steward said within himself, what shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. I cannot dig. To beg I am ashamed. I am resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of the Lord's debtors unto him, and said unto the first, how much owest thou unto my lord? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. And he said unto him, Take thy bill, and sit down quickly, and write fifty. Then said he to another, And how much owest thou? And he said, A hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, Take thy bill, and write fourscore. And the Lord commended the unjust steward, because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. End of chapter 20 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 21 of The Parables by Lyman Abbott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Unjust Judge. Luke 18, verses 2 to 8. There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, avenge me of mine adversary and he would not for a while but afterward he said within himself though i fear not god nor regard man yet because this widow troubleth me i will avenge her lest by her continued coming she weary me and the lord said hear what the unjust judge saith and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? End of chapter 21 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 22 of the Parables by Lyman Abbott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Good Shepherd. 
john ten verses twenty seven to thirty my sheep hear my voice and i know them and they follow me and i give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish neither shall any pluck them out of my hand my father which gave them me is greater than all and none is able to pluck them out of my father's hand i and my father are one end of chapter twenty two recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter twenty three of the parables by lyman abbott this librivox recording is in the public domain the lost sheep luke fifteen verses four to six what man of you having a hundred sheep if he lose one of them doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it and when he hath found it he layeth it on his shoulders rejoicing and when he cometh home he calleth together his friends and neighbors saying unto them rejoice with me for i have found my sheep which was lost end of chapter twenty three recording by the marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter twenty four of the parables by lyman abbott this librivox recording is in the public domain the light of the world matthews five verses fourteen and fifteen ye are the light of the world a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel but on a candlestick and it giveth light unto all that are in the house end of chapter twenty four recording by linda Bray nielsen vancouver b c chapter twenty five of the parables by lyman abbott this librivox recording is in the public domain the fig tree luke twenty one verses twenty nine to thirty one behold the fig tree and all the trees when they now shoot forth ye see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand so likewise ye when ye see these things come to pass know ye that the kingdom of god is nigh at hand end of chapter twenty five recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c end of the parables by lyman abbott